Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the um, third of our um, Fall 2017 Competency Assessment Webinar Series. Um, I'm Eric Brickto, Vice President and Counsel for CAMI, and I'm joined in kicking this off today by Dr. Brad Bavay. Uh, Brad is Assistant Professor at Trinity University's MHA program, uh, the current Chair of our Standards Council, and a longtime CAMI site visitor. Uh, a couple of things before we, we get into this. Um, we are recording this session, and this recording is going to be made available on our website um, in the near future. And as you can probably tell, you're all currently on mute. If you have questions as um, we, we go through the webinar, please um, uh, write them in to the chat feature on the top left-hand side of uh, the screen. And um, we will do our best to answer those as they come up. Now, uh, before we begin, uh, I want to let you know that this webinar series is brought to you at no charge through the generosity of the Don Gideon Foundation. The Don Gideon Foundation was founded in 2015 in memory of Don M. Gideon, a truly strong, intelligent, and creative force in life and in her chosen profession. Dawn dedicated herself to working with struggling healthcare providers and finding creative avenues to success. Honoring the memory of Dawn Gideon, a graduate of the CAMI accredited program of University of Pittsburgh, uh, this series serves to advance the quality of graduate healthcare management education by sharing best practices in competency-based education. Right now, at, at this point, we turn it over to uh, Brad for the next couple of slides. Okay, uh, thank you, Eric. Um, and uh, I want to echo Eric's comments uh, with regards to uh, everybody that is attending today. I want to thank you for uh, for joining us. Um, and as uh, you'll soon hear, we've uh, we've done a couple of these already, um, but uh, really uh, look forward to to having another one because. Uh, as we'll soon discuss, uh, there's really no singular one right way um, to do in what we're, we're trying to do. Um, so what you're going to hear today is uh, a bit of a, an overview to uh, the CAMI approach to competency assessment. Um, this has been a, a, an evolutionary process, to, for lack of a better way of saying it, um, coming forward from the 20 or a 2008 criteria uh, through the 2013 criteria and now into the current round of 2017 CAMI criteria, we've made a very strong and consistent effort to try to move towards competency-based assessment um, at the individual student level. So again, um, we've found there, there is no one single right way to do in this and thus the genesis behind um, these uh, webinar series to gather good ideas and try to help, uh, you know, basically raise all ships. So <clears throat> if we look backward in time um, to the 2013 criteria, um, one of the primary focal areas of um, the reasons for this webinar series is um, the criteria for accreditation 3C3, which reads, as you see it there on the screen, the program will regularly evaluate the extent to which students and graduates attain the competencies and use that information and data uh, for evaluation for continuous improvement. Um, this has since evolved into the new 2017 criteria for accreditation in 3C2, um, which reads the program will regularly evaluate the extent to which each student attains the competencies at the level targeted by the program and will have a process in place for communicating that information to students. As well, we see it reflected in 3D2, where the program will collect, analyze, and use the assessments of student competency attainment for continuous improvement. Now, one of the primary reasons why we have um, chosen to launch this the webinar or the webinar series is as we look back in time over um, basically the transition from the 2008 through the full round of 2013 criteria, we can see that. 74% of programs received a partially met or a not met in this criterion. So with that in mind, um, we've, you know, again, um, 
generated um, the this webinar series, and uh, you know as we're as we're looking at each one of these programs, um, it's really important to note that again there is no one single right way. Um, so we're trying to generate good ideas and and generate discussion around this topic. Now before we move into today's presentation, um, I want to take a minute and talk about where we've been. Um, our first webinar focused on the approaches of two residential programs, that being the Army Baylor um, and Incarnate Word programs led by Dr. Forrest Kim. And our second webinar focused on the approach of a click and mortar program, Seton Hall, which has both residential and majority online program tracks. Um, today, we'll be featuring two fully online programs. For our speakers and their organizations today, it's important to note that neither Ashford University nor uh, the University of St. Augustine have undergone the CAMI accreditation process. So CAMI, of course, cannot and does not have an opinion on whether their approach meets 3C2 and 3D2. But really, that's not the point of the webinar series. Uh, there is no one size fits all to competency assessment, as I've stated. Um, and there is so much to learn from one another in terms of how we actually do what we do. So a key purpose of this webinar series is to present um, approaches to competency assessment so the programs can create a solution that will work for them. Um, we're thankful for our presenters um, coming and spending their time with us today, um, who first actually shared their process um, at an AUPHA poster session and agreed to, to spend some time with us and present today. Uh, we're thankful um, for their commitment to further advance the quality of graduate healthcare management education by sharing with CAMI programs and other programs that have joined this call who are interested in offering quality education um, to all of our students. So with that, um, I'd like to now introduce um, Kathy Wood, a PhD and a fellow in the Healthcare Financial Management Association. Um, Kathy is the program director um, of the MHA or the University of St. Augustine for Health Sciences, um, and she's also a CAMI fellow. And she's joined by uh, Dr. Laura Slowinski, um, who's the Executive Dean at Ashford University College of Health, Human Services, and Science. So thanks so much and uh, enjoy the webinar. Thank you so much, Brad. Um, I am Dr. Kathy Wood, and the reason Laura and I are presenting together is because I was the MHA program director under her um, auspices in, at Ashford University, just recently made the switch to University of St. Augustine for health sciences, but we still collaborate quite a bit and we still discuss a lot of this. So Laura, if you would like to say a couple of words. Sure, thank you, Kathy. Uh, I'm Laura Slowinski, uh, as he already mentioned, Executive Dean for the College of Health, Human Services and Science. I've been with Ashford since 2011 and uh, we're very excited about the, the recent changes in the requirements, um, allowing more opportunity for online education to pursue CAMI accreditation. So we're going to be looking to uh, apply next year in 2018. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, so one of the things that when we were talking about um, the competencies is how do you assess those? How do people assess those in a traditional based university? How do people assess those in an online university? So some of the things that we'll be covering are the student learning outcomes. You know, these are things that we're looking at is, is how do you have a meaningful session? Do, do we have the CAMI track and does that look different than our other tracks? How do we enhance the soft skills? Because that's what employers are looking for. And how do we fulfill the, the 120 synchronous hour when you are online and when it comes to assessing the competencies? So here are some of the skills that Dekami has outlined on what we need to assess. We have oral communications, presentation skills, technical literacy, collaboration, teamwork, and time management. That may look completely different depending on the university that you're in. Um, I can tell you that some of the things that we do already is from the very beginning of their first class, we have collaboration in an interprofessional education environment. We have in our classes, we have those that are athletic trainers, those that are physical therapists, nurses, healthcare leaders. We have everyone in here together. Some of the ways that we assess these communication skills and presentation skills is throughout the coursework. 
sprinkled in most of the most of them is we have we require the students to to present to us and we not only have peer review of those but we also have instructor feedback with time management we are looking at that from the very beginning that there's a, a lot of um, misnomers about an online education that it allows all the students to be self-paced. That's not entirely true. What, what I tell people is that you, um, from the time that you enter your first class and your unit one, which might equate to, to week one, there are certain assignments and lectures and um, assessments that we're looking at within that first unit. And yes, you can decide to do it on Monday or you can decide to do it, you know, at, you know, the, the crack of dawn on Tuesday morning, but there are still due dates and there are still things that we're looking at when we assess what is going on with our students to make sure that they're attaining the competencies and with the measurements. One thing that you can do is have two tracks for MHA. Um, if, if you want one that's more CAMI focused and one that's not, that might be an option for some of you to look at. One of the things that I mentioned is that employers are asking and, and they're also expecting soft skills. Soft skills you know, can be challenging to assess regardless of the environment you're in, whether that be online or whether that be in a traditional setting. One of the neat things with with CAMI and the synchronous environment in the in the requirement is it allows and requires all universities to assess those in in a face to face fashion. And that's one of the things that I think is advantageous um, to the online schools who are using synchronous sessions. It gives us an opportunity to to view those students and what they're saying, how they're presenting themselves how they're dressed, how they speak, in addition to the communications that may be written. We have to look at assessment for continuous improvement. That's the nature of healthcare. We can't do things if we don't continuously improve. And so throughout this presentation, we'll go through some additional details as to exactly what that looks like in our environment. And the bottom line is what we are instructing students to do is, is so they can either improve in the jobs that they have and move, move up the ladder into leadership or to attain a job in healthcare. If we can't prove that they meet these competencies, then employers most likely are not gonna wanna hire them. So what does this look like when, when we assess the competencies? The one that we will probably focus the most on is, is rubrics. So within every single assignment or discussion or anything that the student is required to do in an online environment, we have rubrics attached to those. So those rubrics um, give the student an idea of what we're gonna be looking for, what they need to do in order to cons be considered that they have mastered this the skill or one that they may need improvement upon. It's, it's like an iterative kind of viewpoint where they can see that, okay, this time I was proficient. What do I need to do to reach that next level of achievement? So they know what the rubrics are ahead of time so they can look for that. And some students are going to try to achieve the mastery level of everything where other ones are okay with being proficient. We have grades associated with what those rubrics look like. Um, it's, you know, depending on the course or depending on where they are within their program, those rubrics, the instructor may, may or may not give, give the opportunity for the student to resubmit. Most of the time, you know, because they do have the rubric ahead of time, we, expect them to meet a graduate level uh, writing or, or communications or whatever that rubric may be on. What we do though is to provide the feedback. So when we click on the proficient box, we it, it has exactly what that proficiency means, but it allows us the opportunity to also add feedback for those students. 
we don't want to just say you met proficiency. We want to say why you met proficiency. So we go in and we actually provide individualized and personalized feedback to each one of our students saying this is what you need to do to get to the next level. We always try to give them some constructive feedback as well as what they did well, because we all know as humans, we like to hear the good news as well as the bad news. The other things that rubrics do for us is no matter how many instructors are teaching or how many sections of that course you have, all of the grading is consistent. So when they choose, you know, when they are grading this particular assignment, their rubric's going to look exactly like mine. So that way we know that our feedback and in, in our grading mechanism is going to be consistent throughout the faculty and among all the, the sections of those courses. Laura, would you like to add something on the, the waypoint at this point? Sure, thank you, Kathy. Um, just as Kathy said, one of the things that, that we definitely do throughout the program is uh, identify the way the competency should be introduced, reinforced, and mastered. And so the rubrics that Kathy's referencing, the, the proficiency level is based on where that student should be in the program. What we use at Ashford is uh, called Waypoint Outcomes, and it's it's very similar to what Kathy just described. That the rubric is consistent no matter what section is being taught, and then that system Waypoint Outcomes feeds it, feeds into a Learning Outcomes database. So for the assignments where we have specific competencies mapped, we can go into the database and see, um, you know, generally what, how well students are doing from any time if the course had been revised. We can we can move the, the time frame and see if this revision has been effective, um, if they're meeting the standard, not meeting the standard. And we do that throughout the program. So as, as, as Kathy mentioned, if, if a student's at the reinforcement level, they should, be, they should be at least proficient. But when they get to the mastery level, if we're looking at that data across the board and we're not reaching mastery, then we need to kind of double check, go back in and see what's happening for those. So I think, Kathy, you did a great explanation on that. There's not really much more I would add. Well, and I think to piggyback off of something that Laura said that's interesting is the fact that we can extract this from a database. So if all of a sudden, like we currently have a rubric that has been used for two terms now, and we're looking at one part of this rubric where all students or the majority of the students are not reaching the level that we feel that they should reach. So that indicates to us that there's a problem somewhere. Is it in the course assignment? I, you know, I would wager to say it's not with the majority of the students, because when you get the majority, something's wrong, usually on, on our end. So that is something that we will look at and we are doing a deep dive into to figure out what is it that is creating this, this issue? Why are students not reaching or attaining the goal that, that we set out for them to attain? So then we look backwards and go, OK, so we need to either enhance the learning here by providing additional resources or additional opportunities for that student to master this, this, um, uh, uh, this goal attainment that we're looking for. And so that's one of the things that we do always as a continuous improvement thing. We look for those exceptions that pop out that that shows us something that that we are not that we're failing to offer for the students to, to allow them to attain that goal. The the other thing that we do is we look at our student surveys. You know what are students telling us? There there are ways that um with depending on the platform that you're using for your online learning management system. Like in the case of Ashford, there was a way that they students could, could ask their instructor. So it doesn't go into the public course room per se, so all the rest of the students see it. And it doesn't go directly to our email. It actually is in a place that is, is between the instructor and the student. And so we'll go back and look at those over the course of a term and look for, for common questions. You know, we had five out of six students ask the same question. So how can we make sure that these students have this information before they have to ask it? So we're trying to go in and we try to make the instructions either more clear 
or provide some additional resources or something for the student. The other thing we do is when we respond back to any discussion question, the we try, try to go in and personalize and customize those for the student if they happen to bring up a case of unions in uh, healthcare, then we will also add to that a, a resource such as a recent article or something that will enhance the discussion that, that just occurred and hopefully enhance the learning. At the end of that weekly discussion, then we will also provide more feedback for the students. And we try to take that feedback from the students and figure out what we need to do to improve that course, because it's all about continuous improvement. So one of the things with, with interactions and observations, um, at least in my world, we have from the very first class opportunities for the students to present in some kind of oral fashion of presentation. We do this early on because we want to make sure that by the time that they graduate from the program, that they're ready to present to the boards and they're ready to present to employers and they're ready to interview and they're ready to do things in, in a manner where they have to be face to face with people. How do we assess that? We observe them, but we also have a rubric. We're looking for certain things. It's, it's really no different than when, when I used to have to do speeches in any of my graduate level classes or doctoral level classes. And, you know, we always had feedback based upon that critique and the, and the rubric. So we do that throughout the program where students have the opportunity not only to do individualized interactions, but team interactions as well. Because we also know that when we're working in the, in the real world in the field, we are not working in a silo. We're working and collaborating among many, many different people. And that's, that's a skill that we wanna make sure that students have. Laura, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I saw a question pop up. And I guess one thing I would um, add in addition to that is, um, so Kathy had mentioned having two tracks. One of our tracks is completely asynchronous um, to address the question. So when we do the presentations, the oral presentations, the students actually post those as videos and get feedback. So obviously the, the drawback from that is you're not getting feedback real time, making the, the adjustments then. Um, but with our CAMI track later in the program, we are gonna introduce um, the synchronous presentations and opportunities for students to engage in that synchronous format. I think one of the only other things I would add, Kathy, is just that um, Kathy had mentioned student surveys, the importance of really paying attention to the end of course surveys. As part of our program review cycle, which our program's going through right now, um, we definitely are always looking for opportunities for continuous assessment, but we've also incorporated a, a faculty course feedback survey. So because we have so many different faculty who may be teaching a course, it's always good to get the input uh, you know, from their perspective and what's working well, what's not working well, do the rubrics seem to match the assignment? Do the students understand the instructions? So just as Kathy was saying, using all of the data that you have available to ensure that you're doing ongoing assessment. Although we may set a target for annual assessment, our faculty have the ability to access that data on a regular basis. So comparing sections that are taught by different faculty, you know, identifying if we should have preferred faculty for certain sections based on the student's experience in those as well. Well, and I think that's one of the, the neat things that, that Ashford does as far as the preferred faculty. Um, it's similar to what some other universities consider lead faculty, where you have one faculty member that sort of oversees the rest of the sections. And if you have adjunct faculty particularly, to make sure that everything is, is the way that we want um, the instruction and to happen, so we can make sure that... Um, the, the students are also given an opportunity to have interaction with faculty. One of the things that we also do is pre and post test. 
and this is a way that we can assess what the students know when they enter the course or at the you know the beginning of, of an assignment and then also at the end. So this will allow us to have an opportunity to, to gauge where their learning has occurred and maybe where there's some gaps. Because as we do continuous um, improvement, we're also looking for places that we have gaps that we need to improve and that we don't have in there. This is just something that it's not graded for the students. It's something that just allows us to be able to see where the students stand and where they are at the end. And then we can go back and we can reassess. Do you have anything to add on this one, Laura? Yeah, Kathy, I was just noticing too, Anthony had a question in the chat regarding um, talking about student reaction to student level competency assessment. And I think the, the pre and post test thing came up just in, in time for that, because I, I think the students really do like to see kind of what level they're starting at. And then at the end of that course, our courses are pretty accelerated at the graduate level. They're six weeks. So if that student can see the progress they're making. Um, but Kathy also mentioned earlier in our, in our rubrics, not only do they assess the level by clicking on proficient, distinguished, basic, but faculty are required to give individual feedback on the areas that students need to improve. And that is what we get the, a lot of positive feedback on is the student will say, I knew exactly what I needed to do differently next time, or I knew how to change this for my next course so that, so that I could achieve that. And I think it's been very positive. And, and one of the things that, um, that we, have, we have some faculty do also is do an audio or a, vis or a video way to provide feedback for the students. They'll actually go through the, the rubric and they'll look at the paper. And when we are grading the papers, we actually, it's very similar to track changes through Word, that we actually put comments actually on the papers as well as provide the feedback through the rubrics for them. The students are very appreciative of the fact that, um, that we would take the time to do an individualized, personalized video for them. We also have meeting rooms that are built into our learning management system, and they vary depending on the, on the learning management system you're using, where we hold synchronous office hours. But Anthony, to also address the, the question that you have, is we do the, um, the, the survey that tool that is out there for healthcare institutions to use or healthcare universities to get a, a feel for the pre and post test on the competency level that the students have at the very beginning of their program and the competency level that they have achieved by the end of the program. So we will look at that and if the student says, no, I don't feel like I'm, I'm achieved this competency, then we will do additional deep diving to figure out what they feel like they didn't meet or how they didn't achieve it and what we can do to help them achieve it. And we'll do that in a number of ways. We'll, we can reach out individually to the student. We can have student groups that um, serve as advisors to us on what they feel like went well within the program and what competencies they didn't feel like they achieved. And we do the same thing with an advisory board, you know, so we'll have a lot of different opportunities to meet with the students. We actually offer a residency for our students that's optional. So the students can choose in particular classes to come towards the end of the trimester to a face-to-face -face residency on campus. And then we also have some interaction and some, uh, some time to, to speak with them in, in a face-to-face -face way, but for those students who, for whatever reason, cannot come to the residency, either they can't afford it, they can't you know, take the time off or whatever the reason is, we also use platforms very similar to what we're using for this presentation, but we use the video as well. So we can actually interact with the students and say, you know, tell me what's going on with this competency, what happened in this class, you know, wh why do you feel like that you were not able to achieve this? What could we have done to support you better or to provide additional resources? And then we'll take the learnings from the, from the students because you know, the majority of our students are already out there working in the field and 
we we cherish the the experience that they have and the in the the feedback that they can provide for us. Industry certifications is another way that um, tool that we use to assess competencies. We currently have um, through the Healthcare Financial Management Association, which is also known as HFMA, we have what we call the Certified Revenue Cycle Representative, which is CRCR, and the Certified Specialist in Business Intelligence, which is CSBI. So within the HFMA world, you know, they had an advisory group that said, if I were to hire somebody working in my revenue cycle area, what competencies and skill sets would they need? So embedded in our classes, we have the study materials where the students can actually go through those study materials. We will hold synchronous sessions, study sessions with them. And we often bring in industry experts for this. So the faculty doesn't have to take that on themselves, but we bring in guest speakers who can speak directly to cash flow or to different things that, the, that um, are required in order for them to be successful on those exams. It gives us an opportunity to not only assess the competencies, but it gives us another opportunity to meet with the students. So it's a, it's a win-win for all. It also gives them an added value that not only do they have a degree in healthcare management or healthcare administration, but they also have industry certification that, that's known in the field. Laura, would you like to add to that? Yeah, the one thing I'll just uh, piggyback on what, what Kathy said. Um, for the industry certifications, we tried this two different ways in embedding in our courses. So the synchronous way, I think, is definitely uh, the more effective way. We did try embedding in an asynchronous course, and the students kind of had all of the materials available to them. Some of the assignments were required, some of them were recommended. What we found was um, the synchronous engagement that Kathy's talking about, where they actually have the opportunity to, to interact with each other, interact with the instructor, interact with the guest lecturers, is by far more effective in the online environment for the industry certification preparation. So that is um, most of what we were going to talk about with assessments. I'm going to go quickly through some synchronous learning sessions that, that I think whether you're an online university or whether you're a traditional seated university, you might find helpful. Um, one of the things that we did for the synchronous is, is to put it into the capstone courses because that's, you know, that way if, if the students chose to do a less engaged um, kind of curriculum, they could take all of their courses in an asynchronous environment until they reach their capstone courses. And then at that point, the, the synchronous hours would be in here. And part of this is through the group case studies, because the other competency that we want to make sure we're, we're able to assess is how teams work together and we put people together in groups. Um, we also do a lot of guest lectures and um, for topics of the weeks and to make sure that they're staying current within their field within the capstone too. Some other options within the, the synchronous learning world is to have it sprinkled throughout the program of study. This, this is one of the ways that we can make sure that not only are we assessing this, the skills, if you can remember the slide that was talking about the oral communications and the presentation skills, then we do this throughout the program of study. So we, we can put it into courses where they can make sure that, that everything is, um, that we have presentations that are required. And as Laura said, that those can be recorded and uploaded through a video or we can stream them live like we do like we're doing right now um, some of the tools are you know google hangouts and those kind of things are free and and particularly as we continue to draw more and more millennials into the the coursework it's amazing how creative they can get with their videos and it's actually quite fun to watch so one of the things that we do is make sure that if they want to do a platform that, that it can be done from their mobile apps and their phones and, and things that the millennials um, are 
very much accustomed to, and those of us a little older, such as myself, have grown very accustomed to them as well. We also have special sessions that we talked about earlier where we, we will actually have advisory board members or experts in the field come in and allow time for students to interact with them that, that not only helps with their learning, but it also gives them more opportunity to network and meet some of the professionals in the field. And then we also have signature assignments. And part of those signature assignments may be a voiceover, it may be a video, or it may, you know, or it may be a face-to-face -face presentation depending on what the student is doing and where the student is in the program. And then like I mentioned earlier, you know, that we have optional residencies for students to come to. Uh, students can also choose if they want to as part of their capstone course to do an internship or an externship. Part of this um, is they end up with a published paper or a presentation at a professional conference. We are also in the process of adding international travels for the students. We feel like this will be a great opportunity for the students to have more of a global um, exposure and to go to a different country and you know to to see how, for example, San Marino, who has um, a huge population but they have no healthcare facilities, how do they handle the healthcare side of this? In, in such a, um, a very succinct way, and it's rated one of the top healthcare systems in the world, how do they do it? And, and how does that compare to the way we're doing things within our own country? And then residencies can also be held online. Um, Amy has done boot camps and does, has done all kinds of things in an online synchronous environment, and we can do the same thing with um, giving opportunities throughout the students for, for them to participate in. Case competitions are another thing that's, that's very widely spread within the universities. And those can be face-to-face -face, and they, those can also be online. There's a, a lot of opportunity for online universities to capitalize on having an online case competition. It's something unique and it's something that may be very attractive to a lot of different people. And then because I am in higher education, of course, I have to cite my sources. And then that is that concludes what what the presentation, but we will take as many questions as people want to ask or if Anthony or Eric or Laura or Brad or anybody would like to add additional information on this. Great. Um, thank you, Kathy and Laura. That that was a um, wonderful presentation. Um, and we, we do have a couple of questions, but before um, we get to those, I, I just want to again thank the, uh, the Dawn Gideon Foundation um, uh, for their, their generous support, um, which has uh, made this webinar series possible. And um, now our First, uh, our first question was from earlier. Um, you were you were talking about the one-on-one um, -on -one communications with students um, on their um, presentations, and uh, this question is from Darren um, about whether each individual faculty member uh, would do that, or if there was one faculty member in charge of all of it. I would love to say that all faculty do that, but but they don't. But we also don't have just one in charge of it. The way we have handled this so far is to allow the, the individual faculty, we, we provide training for them on these variety of tools. And we have it built into our learning management system where they literally just have to click on it and record it. Um, so that this is something that it allows the, the faculty to at least know how to use the tools, and then we encourage it. At this point, we have not required them to provide that kind of individualized video-based feedback, but we do encourage it, and we hope that it, it eventually will become part of the standard. 
Laura, do you have any additions on that? No, I, I agree with what Kathy said. Um, to some extent, it's every single faculty that's expected to provide that feedback. But what we have um, heard from students is the, the faculty who are using the video audio type feedback. Um, they really like that. So I would love to see that become the, the gold standard soon, too. Um, I, I had a question um, as we're going through this. Uh, you, you talked about the um, learning outcomes databases that you use. Um, can you talk a little bit more about those? Are they homegrown? Get them out of the box? And um, can you comment on their effectiveness, please? Laura, I'm yeah, going to let uh, you. Okay, and you can you can fill in because you've used them, Kathy. But Waypoint Outcomes is a homegrown system um, that Bridgepoint Education created, and, and that's what we've been using. So the automated rubrics in every single course are developed through Waypoint. Um, the uh, the databases that we've created have been created with um, you know mostly internal input, but that we use Tableau Tableau to uh, manage those databases. So basically, our faculty will have access to an end of course uh, survey database. They'll have access to course learning outcomes database. Um, the learning outcomes dashboard is the one I was mentioning earlier where you can really drill down into um, kind of where the competencies are being met in the classroom, at what level. Uh, you can drill down to whether or not uh, current revisions have changed that. So we, we have the opportunity to look, you know, how many sections have ran in the past six months versus how many sections ran in the past year. We can compare year over year. And I think that our faculty love it. I mean, it definitely um, helped a lot in terms of, of really drilling into uh, what, what areas we need to improve on and, and what areas I think students are, are being effective in mastering the outcomes. Well, and, and so the, the database that we use is, just, is also we have the automated rubrics that's part of our learning management system. And so we have a, in, um, a staff that will go in and extract the data for us. And then to, to piggyback off of what Laura said, that when the students are struggling with a certain competency, it allows us to go back and, and find out more information about what occurs. Is it the time that it's offered? Is it because we have it out of sequence? Should we have some, some other skill level in, in there in between before we go to something else? And it's, um, I think, uh, at least with the learning management systems that I've used in the past, which is quite a few, when there are rubrics built in, somebody can go in and extract that data. You know, there, it's very similar, like if you were to go into the grade book, you can export that to an Excel spreadsheet and look at it yourself. It's, it's very nice from a faculty standpoint that I can go in and look at all of the grades in unit one and determine, you know, why we have low grades in a certain area. And it allows us to look at student engagement even, you know, because you know, why are students not engaging? You know, why are some in there quite a bit and other students are not what's going on? And so it's, it doesn't only provide a means for us to assess the outcomes, but it, it also gives us a means to assess what's going on with an individual student and reach out to them because they've not been in class or they've not been you know, engaged or signed on to the course room where they're late in turning in their assignments. And you know, that's the other thing that, that's very nice about this is you know, we, have, we assign due dates and when students submit them late, it indicates to us that those are late. So there's a lot of different ways. I don't, you know, um, I think anytime there's data going in, it's sort of like a electronic health record. There's a way to pull it out. Um, we, we have another um, question here about how long uh, these, your, your programs took to establish. Um, so, can you address that? Laura, would you like to go first? Laura, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I wanted to also address why we chose to uh, offer the two separate tracks, because uh, in the online environment, we find a lot of our students are advanced. They're, they've already worked in healthcare many years. They're coming back to school so that they can advance in their position. 
Uh, but we also attract a lot of students who haven't, don't have that, that background experience in healthcare. And we recognize that offering the, the CAMI track, offering the synchronous, offering the embedded industry certificates will bring those students to the level that they really need to be entry point when they, um, you know, when they enter the workforce. And we work closely with, with our advisory board members to find out what skills they're seeing in their new hires that, that you know, maybe we really need to focus on developing, uh, you know, different competencies within the program. So that's kind of why we decided to move towards that track. I would have to say it's a it's a work in progress. It continues to be a work in progress. And, um, you know, we, like, as I mentioned, we do anticipate uh, being able to apply next year for CAMI, but I would say it's, it's going to be a continued work in progress even after that happens. So. And with the University of St. Augustine, um, they actually launched the MHA program in May of this year, and I came on board in April. So I had, you know, one month <laughs> before we actually enrolled students. But they, they actually um, did that because they felt like with the health science offerings that everything was in a direct care-based or clinical mode that, that, that the healthcare administration would be a good addition to this. Um, we have, are currently adding specializations, you know, such as informatics and um, some executive leadership and some other things. And we do that based upon the input from the advisory board most of the time. That's what that's where most of our information will come from, because they they will tell us what the industry trends are and where we need to focus. And then oftentimes we'll have some of the advisory board members willing to step in and be mentors for the students or the faculty. And it's 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 a it's a great resource for us. So you know our our program was just established in May of 2017. So we haven't our first graduates will be in 2019. Um any other questions for our presenters? Anything else? Final thoughts? People a second if if uh they're typing. All right, I'm I'm seeing no more questions. Um Again, Kathy, Laura, thank you very much uh, for an excellent presentation. And um, again, this will be uh, the video will be made available on the CAMI website in in the near future. And um, uh, thank thank you everyone for for coming to this webinar today. Thank you, Eric and Anthony and Brad and Laura. Yes, thank you.